Before we get started, this video was a long-awaited request by one of the wonderful Subscribestar bros. Hope the wait was worth it because, boy howdy, this was a rabbit hole and a half. <laughs> so, City Hunter. City Hunter is, to put it simply, one hell of a franchise. Created by Hojo Tsukasa in 1985, the series follows a mercenary referred to in-universe as a sweeper named Ryo Saiba, living in Shinjuku, under the codename City Hunter. He takes contracts from beautiful women for all sorts of jobs, whether stealing something from a target, acting as a bodyguard, or just full-blown assassinations. The manga follows his adventures as he tries to hook up with his clients, fight off bad guys, and deal with his perpetually frustrated assistant Makimura who tries to keep a handle on Ryo's womanizing ways and get him to actually focus on the mission at hand. Now, City Hunter is an interesting subject to talk about, mainly in that it's neither dead or alive. City Hunter is almost a 40-year franchise, but it's not done with its time in the limelight. Yeah, it's not exactly selling out hotcakes and is the most widely known manga series in history, but it still has a very loyal following, and has been kept alive by various adaptations from all sorts of media. There were anime films in the 90s, live-action films, both East and West, an entire K-drama that ran for 20 episodes. Just recently it had a revival anime film, and there's another one in the works. One that will adapt the actual ending of the manga called City Hunter Angel Dust. On top of this, it's getting another live-action film, this time actually from Japan. Yeah, despite the odds, City Hunter is still alive and kicking. And there's a good reason for that. The series is just fucking fun. You might not realize it since you're all smelly zoomers that get all your information from YouTube videos and the first result that pops up in Google, but this was a heavy hitter for Shonen Jump back in the day. In fact, you'd be amazed at how far City Hunter's tentacles have really spread across the years. Bojo Sukasa is a prolific author, to put it lightly. And what makes it funny is that City Hunter is far from the first thing he made. He worked on a lot of different one-shots. He even won an award for a manga he wrote called Space Angel, which I'm convinced is lost because I can't find it anywhere online, before finally settling on two serialized franchises, Cat's Eye and City Hunter. Now, Cat's Eye is an interesting beast itself because that's a whole franchise as well, and in fact created the inspiration for Ryo Saiba, at least according to Hojo. For context, the story revolves around three sisters who run a cafe called Cat's Eye. In truth, it's a cover for their double lives as phantom thieves, who make it their mission to retrieve the pieces of art created by their father during his days as a child prodigy in Germany. During the Nazi occupation, all of his work was seized and eventually sold on the black market. So the sisters have to outsmart various criminals and law enforcement in order to get their father's art back. Now, Hojo based Ryo off a character from Cat's Eye called Kamiya who is a fan favorite due to being a failed ladies' man that constantly hit on the protagonists, along with being a rival thief that had a back-and-forth relationship with the sisters. Which, if you know anything about City Hunter, yeah, that makes sense. Hell, Cat's Eye is still going on if you can't believe it. Just this year, they had a crossover movie with Lupin the Third, where the two thief teams fight over a target, and they also had a crossover with City Hunter in Shinjuku Private Eyes, which actually isn't even that far of a stretch since the two do take place in the same universe. Like, that's just flat-out canon. The cafe that Miki and Umibuzo work at is Cat's Eye, the, the one from Cat's Eye. Solly Boy here, just to add a quick note for the video. You can watch the original Cat's Eye anime on YouTube on an official upload channel. It only covers up to episode 44, but it's an option for those curious to check out the franchise that birthed City Hunter. Regardless, as you can see, Hojo's work has some serious staying power. In fact, there's a kinda sorta spin-off sequel to City Hunter that ran all the way up to 2017, known as Angel Heart. That is also a franchise. But there's a reason I say it's kinda sorta, because officially it's not canon, but I'll explain why a little bit later. So, City Hunter has a lot of influence, that much is clear. Not just as a series, but Hojo himself has influenced some famous manga. He's friends with Tetsuo Ohara, the author of Fist of the North Star, and even helped out with the Legends of the True Savior film series, by helping helping design Reina. He's also the mentor to Takihiko Inoue, which some of you might be going, okay, who the hell is that? Well, he made a little basketball manga that got pretty big in the 90s. It wasn't much, it was just slam dunk. Yeah, the seventh best selling manga in history. Not even a joke. Another title he worked on was a kinda sorta historical action series. It flopped, don't worry about it, called Vagabond. Yeah, the author of City Hunter was the guy who taught the author of fucking Vagabond how to draw manga. Once again, 
one of the best-selling mangas in history, along with being one of the most critically acclaimed. So that's just Hojo's influence on the manga market. What about City Hunter? Why has it stayed alive all this time? A lot of franchises from back then have withered, even if the authors are well-known or the franchise is really popular, whether through being forgotten or just because they ended and it was time for the new generation to replace them. Not many people talk about Astro Boy anymore, you know? Hell, you look at Shonen Jump today and the landscape is so completely different that it's astounding to think these franchises were in the same magazine where the protagonist is a hitman who gets a massive erection around pretty women. Even Fist of the North Star, a substantially more famous series, has taken a back seat in recent years. Which, just saying, lead in films, uh, you've been killing it with the Bastard remake and the Roroni Kenshin remake. If you could do Berserk and Fist of the North Star 2, I'll give you a whole five dollars. Yeah, so email me if you want, if, yeah, we can work something out here. But you get the point. Why is it that City Hunter just doesn't seem to die? There's never been a period of time where somebody wasn't doing something with this franchise. There's even spin-offs created by fans that are still ongoing to this very day, like the Isekai. I'm not kidding, there's a City Hunter Isekai. It's weird, but I'll save that for the end. Well, what I think keeps City Hunter alive is the actual formula for the series itself. Now, if you're getting excited thinking I'm going to do a chapter-by-chapter -chapter breakdown of City Hunter like I did with Brazil, Zerk. Sorry to burst your bubble. And here's a reason for that. City Hunter doesn't really work that way. A story like Berserk is all one large story that's pushed forward chapter by chapter. There's spoilers to worry about, reveals, twists. You know what I'm talking about. City Hunter doesn't do this. It's a very episodic kind of series. Each adventure is self-contained and everything kind of comes back to a sort of status quo. It really is like watching an old detective show, where the characters stumble into a new case every week and have to deal with a revolving door of new clients. Yeah, there is character development, characters do change, but it's very gradual and not really the point. I mean, it is, but it isn't. Not every single episode will push characters forward, and a lot of the time it's saved for very big events, like a season finale. And it makes sense considering the time period City Hunter came out, which was directly in the middle of the 80s, shows like this were very popular. Oh, there's no doubt you guys were getting a very Charlie's Angels type vibe off Cat's Eye, which I'd bet a kidney to say was intentional. I don't want to go so far as say they're pulp stories, but they definitely have a similar vibe, where it's more about the characters and putting them in wacky situations than really trying to build a larger story itself. That's why you can do so many different movies and spinoffs, because really, you're not stepping on anything or have to worry about strictly adhering to canon. Just make the characters act like how they should act, and you can put them in any situation you want them to. And who exactly are the characters? Well, I think I stalled long enough. Let's actually talk about the cast, at least a little bit. So, the list of characters, at least the ones who are canon and in important to the story goes as follows. Ryo Saiba, the protagonist, number one hitman in the criminal underworld of Japan, and his codename is the eponymous City Hunter. Very, very excellent gunslinger and hopeless womanizer. Kaori Makamura, his assistant and slow burn love interest, the sister to Ryo's partner who is sadly murdered in the beginning of the story. He takes her in and promises to protect her, and eventually the two become partners. Umibuzo, the best friend rival to Ryo who helps him out when situations get tough. Kind of a gentle giant, though there are times where he's very much not gentle. Miki, the love interest to Umibuzo and a female mercenary that also helps the gang out when situations call for it, who works at the Cat's Eye Cafe, and she eventually drags Umibuzo to work in the cafe along with her. Saiko Nogami, the detective who is able to cover for Ryo's shenanigans due to being the daughter to the police commissioner. She also has him completely wrapped around her finger and loves to exploit his womanizing way in order to get him to do free jobs for her. These are just the main players, because there's actually a lot more characters who pop in and out. You also have Psycho's various sisters, the various partners Ryo worked with back before he came to Japan, some helpful, some want to kill him, Kaori's family, you get the idea. Now once again, a lot of this is episodic. In fact, some of these people show up for a single story arc and vanish. Some, a single chapter on top of that, because as mentioned, City Hunter is structured more like a Case of the Week detective show. In fact, most every chapter or episode has a pretty loyal formula it sticks to. One you can outright guess by heart once you see it enough times. Ryo encounters a pretty lady he wants to bang. Said pretty lady has an issue she needs help with, usually bad guys that want to kill her for reasons she can't understand. Ryo acts like a bodyguard, walking with her to her job or to go shopping, etc. And he also either always moves in with the client or the client stays with him. There are shenanigans where he's always sexually harassing various women around them, sexually harassing the client. Uh, sometimes come nighttime, he wants to cuddle up to the pretty lady, then Cal repeats the shit out of him. Then eventually the bad guys attack the pretty lady multiple times, and through every attempt, Ryo finds out more about why they want to kill her, leading up to a showdown where the truth is revealed, and Ryo gets into a gun battle with the bad guys, coming out victorious and the lady now
now safe, and sometimes he's actually able to charm them enough to consider dating them. It's a very loyal formula, pretty much 95% of chapters or episodes in City Hunter follow this. There's definitely exceptions, mainly in the very beginning and the very end, and even then there's hints of it. This might sound like you're reading the same thing over and over again, and you wouldn't be totally wrong. But that's the thing, with this style at least. City Hunter wasn't really written to be binged. It was a weekly series that was made to give you a fun adventure with every issue of Jump. Yeah, it sold volumes where you could just binge it, and just the fact you have all the chapters and episodes together means you're gonna have people who sit down and try to go through the whole thing, so it's sort of a case where you have to go in knowing that this isn't really a story to try to finish. Because if you do, there's definitely cases where it can start feeling repetitive, I won't even lie, but the actual experience of the chapter themselves can be very entertaining. I say how a character can show up for a single chapter, but those chapters can vary wildly in length, and could even have up to two or three parts for the story arc to really wrap up. There's some chapters that go over 100 pages, so while you might not have the next monster for a plot, the episodes themselves are fun as hell to read through, and the fact they're able to pump these out weekly is impressive, not gonna lie, because City Hunter's art is fantastic. It can look a little rough in the beginning, a little, but that's mainly Hojo trying to iron out the style, deciding between a more cartoonish or realistic look, but it's quickly settled into a good compromise, and even has a pretty distinct look for it. Now Angel Heart is where you get into full-blown trying to emulate reality, which some people have strong feelings about, they kinda like the more cartoony vibe that City Hunter can have, but yeah, you, you see a clear evolution in the art. Regardless, you probably shouldn't binge City Hunter. You want to check out maybe a few episodes, a movie or two, or read some chapters of the manga. You want to get a taste before diving in, because you might burn yourself out trying to push through it all at once if you never experienced it before. This is just an in-case thing, because some people fucking love City Hunter. The various adaptations are just a piece of it, but it goes beyond that. Ryo is a pretty iconic character in Japan, despite, funny enough, being a pretty simple guy on paper. He's a hitman that loves women drinking and kicking ass. And there's a ton of characters like that, not even just in manga. Really, he can almost feel like Japan's answer to James Bond, but a lot goofier. Because yeah, he's a pretty comedic guy. You might think with the case of the week formula and an emphasis on a duo team, it'd be more accurate to compare it more with Sherlock Holmes. But nah, there isn't really any mystery solving. It's there, but it's mainly waiting for bad guys to take a shot at them, so then they can interrogate them and find out what's going on. Plus, Japan already has their own Sherlock Holmes tribute with Detective Conan. I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I'm just not. Please. But when you actually sit down and read City Hunter, you see that there is more under the surface than just his archetype. The guy is pretty complicated. Not to say Ryo is an anti-hero, in fact, it's not even debated whether or not he's a hero. Yeah, he's a hitman, but there's never a story where he's doing something morally dubious or evil. This isn't Mr. Inbetween or Barry, where it's all about how a hitman balances his evil nature with trying to live a normal life. No, Ryo is very much a good guy. Even when it looks like he's about to do something fucked up, it's only ever because he thinks there's no other choice, or there's an angle he's keeping close to his chest until it's time. And for the former, there's always a character that snaps him out of it and he's able to save the day at the end. Ryo's big flaw isn't that he's struggling with his morality or anything like that, it's that he really likes girls. Hell, in universe, City Hunter is regarded most of the time as a local legend, not a scary story or anything that people fear. I mean, there are occasions where that's the case, mainly when a cop is looking into it, but most of the time, City Hunter is talked about in a good light. No, Ryo's big problem is his lust. He really, really, really likes women. This guy is pretty much trying to score chicks 24 hours straight. He loves porn, soap lands, brothels, hostess clubs. He's outright made a policy for his company that he won't take a request if it wasn't made by a beautiful woman. And this makes up a lot of the humor in City Hunter. Rio's quest for coochie. If you really liked Pepe Le Pew skits from Looney Tunes, you'd love the humor in City Hunter. Hell, Rio is basically Johnny Bravo, but has a huge ass 357. Hello, 911 emergency. There's a handsome guy in my house. Oh. <laughs> Wait a second, cancel that. It's only me. Now, Ryo isn't a complete fuck-up as a ladies' man. In fact, he's pretty successful off-screen. It's just that the times we see him are when he goes too far or completely flatlines. Because it's funny. And this leads to an interesting point I want to talk about in regards to this series, and really anime humor at large. A lot of people, mostly on Twitter, have really strong feelings on the thing known as fan service. Fan service, at least the literal definition, is anything made to specifically pander to fans, whether it's making a certain character really cool or having a long-awaited fight take place. For instance, you might have a game where there's a fan-favorite character who in the sequel gets a bigger role because so many people liked him. Stuff like that. But in anime, it's used to refer to sexual titillation. Girls in bikinis, erotic scenarios, nudity, sometimes more tame and just giving warm moments between two characters in love. Things like that. It's a long-lasting practice that is really pretty harmless, 
but in recent years, people have thrown entire 100 years war-level shit fits over fan service. at best accusing it of ruining a franchise, and at worst accusing the creator of being a pedophile for including it. Xenoblade fans, I feel your pain. It's something that really shows how psychotic and mob mentality people can get when they smell the chance at social media clout, because that's all it is. If you don't believe me, pay attention to how many posts gunning after fan service and anime are recycled targeting very large franchises right as they have big moments or get popular. It's really artificial, especially when you look into a lot of the people who post it and find out that their Twitter likes are full of anime porn, which can make it feel all the more sleazy. It's one thing to say you don't like anime, and it's another to accuse people of being pedophiles because they put girls in bikinis, especially if they're in their 20s and in college. I still haven't gotten over the Uzaki situation, not even gonna lie. Quick warning to people who like to clout farm on Twitter, your likes are fully public, and everyone will see the My Hero Boys love shit you have. Yeah, this crowd is the homunculus of the Tumblr NeoGAF refugees that fused with Twitter when the Exodus happened, so they'll jerk off to Steven Universe porn, but if there's ever an anime girl in a bikini, they will gun after you and demand your skin. So the worst, most obnoxious hypocrites ever that somehow can rally people into fiery mobs despite themselves being blatant perverts. Hell, just recently they're gunning after the jobless reincarnation author for having the gall of addressing slavery as a complicated subject, and not something you can just stop without any lasting consequences. The reason I bring this up is because this franchise is basically the embodiment of everything this crowd hates. It has a lot of crass, sexual humor, the protagonist is a chad hero that likes to perv on women, there's a lot of jokes of him touching girls without permission, they beat the shit out of him for it, but point stands. It has damsels in distress that Ryo has to save after they get kidnapped, but thinking of a series like this as a list of what to do, what not to do, feels so reductive and miserable. It becomes more about waiting for something to piss you off and mark off a checklist instead of enjoying the story for what it is and embracing the cartoon logic. Yeah, Ryo shouldn't be touching a woman's ass without consent. That's why it's funny when they beat him up or Kaori hits him with the hammer. He's getting his comeuppance. You can have a character do something skeezy without outright making them a bad person or a caricature. For some reason, there's this idea that you need to have a character stick to a very strict moral alignment without ever stepping outside or there's something else different. Like, just because a villain does something not Nice, it doesn't mean that they aren't evil, and just because a good guy does something kinda bad doesn't mean they aren't good. Context matters. And the context behind Ryo in his womanizing ways is that it's a funny aspect to his character. He's so over the top with his antics that it's impossible to take it seriously as him trying to take advantage of a woman. Hell, a long-running joke is the exact opposite of this happening. Psycho, the detective I mentioned earlier, is very manipulative. She knows exactly how to talk Ryo into taking jobs from her with the promise of sex, but she's always able to weasel out of it and leave Ryo holding the bag. The story is very aware of how desperate Ryo looks and pokes fun at him all the time. Another constant joke from the manga is that when he sees a woman he likes, he sprouts a massive heart on. Completely goofy and insane, and you would really have to stretch to say this is objectifying anyone, really. It's just meant to be fun. Which describes City Hunter to a T. It's just fun. And really, speaking of female characters, that's another thing where the modern analysis would completely miss the point. I mentioned before that City Hunter uses the damsel in distress trope. In fact, it uses it a lot. But the thing is that every time it's used, it does make sense. The idea that you throw the baby out with the bathwater and complain any time it's used just inspires the opposite to happen. To subvert the cliché so much, it itself becomes a cliché. Which, if you watch pretty much any media from the last 30 years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The girl can save herself, she finds a way to outsmart the bad guys, the guy's native for even trying to help. There's a lot of different subversions to this. Some of it can be clever. It's all about how it's used. The problem is that people think that now that's just the standard, to the point that we honestly have more media subverting damsel in distress than anything that used it unironically. So all we've done is gone to the opposite extreme. Hell, some critics flat out list the trope itself as a story flaw, regardless of if it makes sense in the plot or not, which kind of feels lazy and peacocky, like some arrogant, you should know better lecture than actual critique. Ironically, because City Hunter is unafraid to tackle it head on, it actually feels a lot more respectful, because it shows the difference between the women who can fight and the women who are just normal people, dragged into a world they don't belong in. City Hunter has a ton of awesome female characters. Psycho can manipulate pretty much any man to do what she wants, and if that doesn't work, she'll slash you to ribbons with her knives. There's also her sister Reika, who goes head-to-head -head with Yakuza organizations and blackmails them in order to pay back the families of cops they murdered. There's a situation where she gets in over her head, but she's still proud of her work and is a very talented private detective. Miki is a former mercenary that can hold her own in a fight and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Umibuzo, a mercenary that is a complete equal to Ryo. There's also Bloody Mary, who is a legendary mercenary who operates in America, 
Of course, you have Kaori. Kaori is so important to the story that she is quite literally the second protagonist. She's the adopted sister to Ryo's old partner, Makimura, and after he's gunned down by a drug cartel he was investigating, his last wish is for Ryo to take in Kaori and protect her. She quickly adjusts to her role as Ryo's new partner, and their bond is the driving force of a lot of the story. While Ryo is obsessed with conventionally attractive women, Kaori's a tomboy, to the point that Ryo flat out doesn't see her as a woman and treats her more like a sibling. Each female character has a lot of history and personality behind them, to the point that really, trying to boil them down to damsel in distress or hashtag gaslight girl boss, it just makes it feel so less fun. Like you're actively getting in the way of being able to enjoy any part of City Hunter. You don't have to have that checklist in your hand as you're watching it, it's just meant to be fun. Also, the whole thing with Kaori not being hot. Yeah, this is actually a case where the art kind of gets in the way at that point, because you have to suspend enough disbelief to think a woman who looks like this isn't the toppest of fucking top tier. I mean, come on dude. I know Ryo is just coping because he doesn't want to bang his best friend's sister, but you honestly can't convince us that she's ugly, especially since they keep making jokes that she looks like a dude. Like, come on. It's not an actual problem because it leads to funny misunderstandings, but, but the fact it takes as long as it does for Ryo to think she's hot is astonishing. And actually, let's keep talking about Kaori, because she is very important. She's a very fun character, a newcomer to the criminal underground that isn't really ever treated as an outsider or a naive idiot, but they do make a point that she doesn't really belong here. The point of the story isn't about dragging people down to being violent criminals, it's not breaking bad. They are heroes that help those that can't get help anywhere else. The main thing is the danger. You could die doing this. The entire reason Psycho looks the other way on a lot of the damage they cause is because they're capable of so much good that it simply outweighs the cost. And Kaori's personality drives this point home. She's very fun and energetic, a complete foil to Ryo. Where Ryo can be an asshole that just cares about booze and women, Kaori's very empathetic and she genuinely cares about people. Whenever he goes off the deep end and tries to schmooze a woman, she's there to quickly correct him and get him back on track. Of course, this can lead to a soft mind battle between the two where they try to outsmart each other. It's a funny dynamic, and the two really do have good chemistry. Really, their bond is the point of City Hunter. Seeing the two work together, butt heads, save each other's necks, and eventually fall in love. While there isn't really a plot in City Hunter, in pretty much every adaptation, they take the time to address how much Ryo and Kairi care for each other. It's Kairi, you dumb fuck. Hell, Shinjuku Private Eyes ends with confirmation that Ryo is in love with Kaori, so it could be seen as taking place close to the end of the manga. The reason I mention all of this is because it shows that there is a lot more thought put into the female characters than you would think, and the fact you can clearly see the difference between a woman adjusted to the underworld and a completely normal person. No, a woman who works as a Broadway dancer isn't gonna know how to escape a kidnapping or fire a gun. You gotta have some loyalty to realistic human behavior, even if you're making a story that's completely crazy and over the top. People need to act like people. That means some will panic, some will know how to fight. It's not a cliche or outdated trope to address this, especially since the whole point of the story is that Ryo is a hero that can save the day. Cause yeah, while Ryo is a joke, he's not a complete joke. The guy is a very competent hitman, his skills with a gun are downright superhuman, capable of hitting a moving target the size of a pin with 100% accuracy. The moments where he's a complete goober are there to contrast the fact that he is a legit badass. He's outright the number one hitman in all of Japan. It shows enough respect for the guy to let him both be a fuck-up and a prodigy. In fact, there's times where he'll intentionally be goofy and ridiculous to get an enemy to drop their guard, so you can have these fun moments where you aren't sure if Ryo is playing a mind game with somebody, or if he actually just walked blindly into a trap. These especially come up if the foil is a woman, since that's his one weakness. He can very much be manipulated by a femme fatale, that is the entire joke with Psycho. But there's occasions where it's not a joke, and he's very much being led by the nose by a woman who's out to kill him. The whole point is that City Hunter actually respects its characters. Everyone has the chance to be funny, badass, look like an idiot, need to be saved. You get the idea. You see different sides of them and learn more about them, to the point that they can almost be unrecognizable from how they began. Not that City Hunter is the deepest characters in the industry, but there's definitely more to them than just being two-dimensional jokes. Hell, they double down on this in Angel Heart, where it's all about how much time has started to wear down the cast, and they're dealing with loss and regrets. Angel Heart all around is a lot darker than the mainline series, so some of you guys might actually think it's better than the original, but it's a personal preference thing. And really, I think it's time to talk about the various adaptations and how they differ from the manga. Some differences are minor, others are substantially different, to the point that it kind of changes the entire story at certain points. So, the manga ran for 191 chapters altogether. Not the longest, but definitely not a slouch either, especially when you consider page length. 
The anime ran for four seasons, starting off with just City Hunter and ending with City Hunter 91, at 140 episodes by the time it was over. There's also the special episodes, Bay City Wars and Million Dollar Conspiracy. They're referred to as movies, but it was just special episodes that were like barely 45 minutes. You also have the various actual anime movies, of which there are currently five, with the sixth in the works that's due in September this year, assuming this video isn't out by the time it released. City Hunter 357 Magnum, The Secret Service, Goodbye My Sweetheart, Death of the Vicious Criminal Ryo Saiba, and Shinjuku Private Eyes. And the new one is named City Hunter Angel Dust. There's also the live action adaptations. City Hunter from 1993 starring Jackie Chan. City Hunter from 2011, a Korean drama that ran for 20 episodes. Nikki Larson and the Cupid's Perfume, a French live action film that came out in 2018. And just last year, it was announced that Japan will make its own live action City Hunter film. Technically, there's another Hong Kong adaptation that came before the Jackie Chan film, Savior of the Soul, but it's so different and only took bits and pieces that that really the timeline officially starts with the Jackie Chan film. So as you can see, City Hunter has a lot of different adaptations. Not just animes either, but for the anime itself, it's sort of the definitive one, because it does follow the story and has some of the most well-known parts of the franchise. The biggest ones being the voices of Ryo and Kaori, Kazui Ikura and Akira Kamiya. They are the voices of Kaori and Ryo the point that they've been the only Japanese voice actors for them in every single anime, the only exception being the Japanese dub to the French live-action film, where they're voiced by Koichi Yamadera and Miyuki Sawashiro. But even then, they have cameos as other characters, namely Monsieur Mokuri and the wife of the character Skippy. Even as far as the 2019 film, they were the voices of Ryo and Kaori. Hell, they're coming back for Angel Dust too, which makes sense as it's the final send-off and the ending of the manga. Really, the rest of the cast has been unchanged for Japan all this time. Yoko Asagami as Saiko, Mami Koyama as Miki, Yoshino Takamori as Reika, Tesho Genda as Umibozo. They've been the cast for over 40 years. And to make it even crazier, do I know another iconic role that Akira Kamiya is known for? Okay, don't actually try to answer that. This dude did a lot of stuff. A lot of you might be trying to guess Perseus from Saint Seiya or Roy from Macross Zero. The correct answer is Kenshiro from Fist of the North Star. That's right, the same voice actor that plays one of the goofiest manga characters is also one of the most stoic badasses. <laughs> Bow before the king, children. Insolence shall be met with death. Now, the actual anime itself is an interesting one. It does cover pretty much most of the events from the manga, but there are exceptions. For one, it cuts out some of the humor, namely the boner jokes. Yeah, if you remember, there's a running gag in the manga that whenever Ryo gets excited by a woman, he gets a massive erection. It's a gag that usually ends up with him getting hit in the dick, getting injured, something to that effect. Plus, just the absurdity that a professional hitman will pop a hearty in public because he thinks his client is pretty. The anime skips over all of these. Most likely for content, because it's something parents could probably get pissed off about, and the main idea of the jokes are still adapted, Ryo creeping on girls and stealing their panties, stuff like that. But another thing that gets skipped over are some plot points from certain cases. In fact, there's episodes that only adapt the first half of a case and end it right there. The best example is the episode that actually introduces Psycho, since that's the most egregious example. The episode starts off with a man attempting to murder her after discovering Psycho might have broken into his apartment but she's able to turn the tables and knock him out, then able to listen in on a call from his boss and find out that this was a contract hit. Psycho then approaches Ryo with a job offer, try to steal a crown from a historical exhibit. The crown is being used to transport state secrets due to a microfilm attached inside of it, and the police want to intercept this before the terrorists can complete the transfer. Now right out the gate, it's different because the scene with Psycho being attacked isn't in the manga. Instead, she's the one that tries to kill Ryo in his bed, as it's a game the two like to play to sort of test each other's skills. Kaori walks in on the two, and that's when they get the job offer. There's also a scene where Psycho gets into a car chase with another assassin, but once again, that's filler. The chapter itself goes right to the night of the heist where they try to fight off terrorists. In fact, instead of adapting the two trying to infiltrate the museum in disguise, it just cuts right to the exhibit room where they have to figure out how to get past the bulletproof glass without tripping the sensor. You get a scene where they go to the museum during the day, but it's mainly a setup for the car chase, because Ryo screws up and gets too close to the crown, which makes the terrorists posing as security get paranoid about them. Now, this is all debatable shit. To crunch down the whole story arc in a 24 minute episode, you have to decide what to keep and what to get rid of, and they decided to not adapt the entire story arc. Some of it is kind of weird to get rid of, since you don't get to see Psycho beat the shit out of a bunch of terrorists, showing that not only can she manipulate, but she can throw down when it comes to it. I mean, the anime does 
kinda do that too, but mainly with the car chase. So you sacrifice one big fight scene with a single car chase. The thing is, that isn't the only substantial change. It plays out mostly the same after this, the key to beating the bulletproof class is to have Ryo fire a magnum into it and then push that bullet through with the force of a second shot, letting them pierce the glass and break the sensor. Now in the anime, this is the big climactic moment. They fight off the remaining security guards, make an escape, and you find out Psycho dipped out on the pay. The pay actually being her having sex with Ryo. But in the manga, this is the beginning of the arc. It turns out this was the first step to uncovering who the terrorists actually were. That being the henchman to a warlord that just completed a quiet coup against the president of a foreign nation, and now is selling state secrets to the highest bidder. Psycho's plan was to get caught trying to steal the microfilm, and the reason she hired Ryo was to help her escape. The two are kidnapped and taken to the embassy where they will technically be on foreign soil and therefore be able to be executed. They manage to get the upper hand on their captors, Ryo is talked to infiltrating the warlord's mansion, and they have to work their way past his security, even infiltrating his all-female army made up of his personal harem. Psycho and Ryo get separated, Ryo ends up having to hide his lust as he's disguised as a female soldier around other beautiful female soldiers. There's even a sergeant who looks suspiciously like Kaori that is able to carry Ryo all the way to a bed for an inspection. Ryo is like 6 foot 4 and covered in muscle by the way, like Jesus. Meanwhile, Psycho is captured by the Warlord and has to play a cat and mouse game to avoid being killed. In the end, it's revealed that the Warlord's actually the twin brother to the real president, who has swapped places and assumed control over the country. They manage to kill him, and the real president takes back control, and he's actually so thankful to the help that he lets Ryo sleep with his entire harem, which Ryo is happy for, but before anything else, he wants Psycho to pay up. He'll sleep with her first, and then the harem. Except she already got on the helicopter and left Ryo behind to receive death by Snoo Snoo from the sergeant and her friends. I repeat, Ryo is like 6 foot 4 and she's able to look down on him. Based. Psycho thinks she managed to escape from Ryo, but he manages to track her down, with her to almost a skeleton since he had sex with up to 40 women until they couldn't stand up anymore. And while the flesh is spongy and bruised, his spirit is willing. And the story arc ends with Ryo reminding Psycho that she still owes him two nights together. So all of that was not covered in the anime. Which is sad, because it's a lot of fun. Ryo and Psycho trying to infiltrate the embassy, the harem army, the end confrontation with the warlord, Ryo getting to smash an Amazon mommy, there's a lot that got left on the cutting room floor. Later episodes that cover manga material aren't as blatant. It's mostly this and the story arc with the actress, which even then, that was more because they left out the joke where Ryo gaslights her boyfriend and is trying to fuck him up the ass to mess with him. Yes, this is a joke in the series. There's a lot of crazy jokes that got left out, it's kinda sad. You still get the one where Ryo is traumatized by transvestite though, so that's pretty funny. Now, the biggest thing to talk about with the anime is the fact that there's a lot of filler. I mean, a lot of filler. To the point that you can look up a chart that separates filler episodes from canon episodes, and altogether you have 60 canon episodes. Yes, 60. Out of a franchise that has over 140 episodes, 2 specials, and 5 animated movies. By the way, none of the movies or specials are canon. Yeah, none of them. They are also filler. The only one that's gonna be canon, which we don't even know just yet how much it'll stick to it, is Angel Dust. Now before you guys look up the filler chart and think you can just skip everything for the sake of the story, you have to remember that even the manga itself is pretty episodic. There's already a ton of self-contained chapters and story arcs that are only really there for a moment before drifting off into the aether. Yeah, if you want the actual full canon story, read the manga and follow that chart, which even then can't be accurate because even the story stuff skips some stuff. I just explained it with the Psycho episode. It's why it's so easy to make a filler story for a special or a movie, because the story itself has plenty of slots to fit this into. In fact, some of the filler episodes feel exactly like a canon chapter, even if some of them can cause changes that are substantial in nature. Like for example, there's an episode where Ryo's friend from America, Robert, comes to Japan to sightsee. Him and Ryo bond and are eventually dragged into a job together where they have to defend a princess from assassins. It's revealed that Robert is actually in league with the terrorists and tries to kill Ryo in a duel. Ryo wins and is forced to shoot Robert dead. Now this is just a filler episode, this doesn't happen in the manga. What does happen in the manga is that Ryo's best friend from America comes to sightsee, a guy by the name of Mick Angel, and the two pal around before being pulled into a job together. That job being that Mick was hired to kill Ryo, but Mick's MO is to steal the lover of his target before he kills them in order to prevent them from being hurt by their loss. So he decides to try to seduce Kaori, since by the time he shows up in the manga she is head over heels for Ryo, and he's even able to manipulate her by preying on her insecurities on whether or not Ryo sees her as an equal partner or not. 
since the whole time she's panicking that Ryo isn't taking the threat on his life seriously, and she's afraid of losing him. This ends with Kaori challenging Mick to a duel, hoping to kill him before Ryo could get hurt, and prove her skills as a sweeper. She actually gets close too, since Mick refuses to fight her because he genuinely likes Kaori, and in the end, Ryo has to intervene. You have another setup for a duel, with Ryo demanding Kaori stay out of the fight, though she says that if Ryo dies, she'll set off the explosives she planted in the abandoned building they're in, because she would rather be dead than live without Ryo. This snaps the two out of it, and Mick just says, fuck it, calling off the duel and the job, since he doesn't want to hurt his friends. So, already, you can see a massive difference between the two similar stories from the anime and the manga. Now, the anime didn't adapt this plot from the manga and just change things up. No. In fact, it might actually be the opposite. You see, the episode with Robert in the anime was in City Hunter 2, basically season 2 of the anime. It ran from April 2nd, 1988 to July 14th, 1989. By this time, the manga had only released volume 20 in June 1989, which covered up to chapter 101. Mick Angel showed up in chapter 175, which was just 16 chapters away from the manga's conclusion. So it could actually be a case where Hojo Tsukasa saw the episode from the anime and decided to incorporate a similar idea in the actual manga. Hell, Mick kinda looks like Robert, just a little bit. And the whole idea of Ryo's former best friend comes from America for fun, but reveals that he actually wants to kill him, is too similar not to mention. Now the whole plot with the princess is just because, oh my fucking god, there are so many princess sneaks off and must be protected by Ryo plots in the anime. There's a lot of filler episodes that did that. Now, I don't know for sure, I can't really find any Word of God statements that point to one thing or another. Hell, they actually reference this plot again in City Hunter 3, where Robert's lover comes to Japan with the intention of killing Ryo, which sorta kinda feels like a remix of the plot point from the manga, where the daughter of one of Ryo's partners in America tries to get revenge on him after he killed them in the past. Once again, kind of a chicken and egg deal, we don't know if maybe it inspired the manga, or if the opposite, I, I, you, you, get the, you guys get the idea. There's a mixture of canon and filler in the original anime. Now, while I said that each movie is not canon, that doesn't mean you should ignore them. They're actually pretty damn fun, with my favorite being Shinjuku Private Eyes, because that is just a shameless love letter to not just City Hunter, but even Cat's Eye as well. Every anime theme is used in the soundtrack. The humor is exactly the same with just as crazy jokes. The animation is pretty fucking killer with some pretty great action scenes. Even with them pushing the story into modern day, they understand the energy and vibe a City Hunter story should have. You even get an intro scene that's a collection of manga panels and the characters in their new designs. It really does feel loyal to the series. I highly recommend Shinjuku Private Eyes, but the other movies can be just as fun. Death of the Vicious Criminal Ryo Saiba actually dips into some themes, like media manipulation, and even explores aspects of Ryo's past as a child soldier. It's all not canon, but what they pitch is pretty interesting itself. Some are definitely better than others. Bay City Wars, which is one of the special episodes, feels like a discount diehard plot, but it doesn't really have enough time to build anything up. It's only like 45 minutes altogether, so it just kinda has to come and go without really doing anything. And 357 Magnum is just sort of okay, at least to me personally. It's a sort of kind of spy thriller using a fake nation for an allegorical East Berlin, West Berlin story, but there's nothing that really hits an oomph for me. Which sucks, because I like spy thrillers, it just sort of felt by the numbers. It's a personal thing, so don't take my word for it, other fans will probably love it. But now, we need to actually talk about the heavy shit. The live action adaptations. How do they stand up to the manga, and are they a complete shit show? Well, the first thing I want to say is that City Hunter could absolutely work in a live action format. Yeah, it has a lot of zany humor, the most popular gag is Kaori beating the shit out of Ryo with a giant cartoon mallet, but you can make this work in live action by simply downplaying the jokes to be more grounded. Hell, not even that much, because there's a ton of comedies that have very over-the-top and out-there senses of humor. I mean, Airplane, anyone? And there's also films with a lot of vulgar sex jokes. American Pie? Not even just that, but City Hunter actually has some clever bits and funny dialogue. You don't have to rely on being a complete cartoon or shoving titties on the screen all the time. You could easily sell it as an over-the-top action comedy, like something Shane Black would direct. And there's actually been a few attempts, some better than others. The first one to mention is the Jackie Chan film, coming out in 1993. City Hunter follows an original story, like every movie, that has Jackie Chan play the iconic Ryo. Him and Kaori try to track down the daughter of a CEO that ran away from home and possibly went to Hong Kong. The duo then board a luxury ship that's quickly taken over by terrorists, so they must get the girl back to her family and defeat the bad guys. Standard City Hunter fare. And honestly, this movie isn't that bad, but it commits some major sins. The slapstick comedy is 
fine. I mean, it, it's weird that there's a criticism for the movie, despite the manga being well known for slapstick comedy, but it's more the fact that they're mad that it happened at all instead of the fact that it can be hit and miss. It's also the fact that you have to find a way to sell Jackie Chan as an uber chad womanizer. Now, the guy is a very talented martial artist. I mean, he's a legend for a reason, but being able to pull off a suave womanizer that can go full Johnny Bravo at the drop of a hat is hard, and it's just not really something I can buy with Jackie Chan. Maybe it's a biased thing, because every movie I've seen the guy in, he's a lot more downplayed and awkward. He's sort of like an everyman that just so happens to beat ass, you know? Some people outright accuse the movie of not letting him use a gun, which isn't really true. Yeah, his actual 357 Magnum doesn't pop up too many times, but there's multiple scenes where he grabs a weapon and starts blasting, and they do keep true to his superhuman gunslinger abilities. But I would be lying if I said the movie didn't prioritize the martial arts more than the gunfights. Now I get why. You cast Jackie Chan for a movie, you best let him beat some ass with his bare hands. And it's not like Ryo doesn't use martial arts himself in the manga. It's just that it makes it seem like it's his main way of fighting, which isn't really City Hunter. Hell, most people agree that the movie is pretty damn fun, but as an adaptation of City Hunter, it can piss a loyalist off. I don't hate this movie. It's not my favorite. I can enjoy it. It's cheesy, but that's always been a part of the fun to the franchise anyway, and the fact they did try to emulate the goofy humor in the manga is commendable. A pretty famous scene is when they have to pretend to be Street Fighter characters for a fight scene. That was pretty funny. But apparently Japan is pretty split on this. Gintama had an episode that was just the characters shitting on the movie and making fun of Jackie Chan. There might be a Gintama video in the future, I can't even lie. And I will say that maybe some jokes are lost in translation, because you have a very early 90s Hong Kong action comedy that's adapting a Japanese manga. Some of the jokes will just fall flat, and some can even veer into sheer nonsense. The worst are when they do a quip or something like that, because that's when it can fully fall into what the fuck was the punchline. Also, I'm not really a big fan of how they handled some of the characters. Some of the jokes are funny. Anytime any of the girls try to seduce a dude, it would fail horribly and they'd get the shit beat out of them. I thought it was funny. But then you had these two Randys that were on the ship that just kept showing up and did jokes and I had no idea who the hell they were. It was confusing. Maybe somebody that's more familiar with Cantonese can pick up on the pace and how the joke is supposed to sound, but personally there are a lot of moments where I was just confused. Also, Kaori is just sort of there. She's relevant in the beginning, but by the end she doesn't really do too much. Her main thing is just following Ryo around and going, Oh, Ryo, you piss me off so much, which I mean, that is what she does, but she does a hell of a lot more than that. Also, the Chinese movie changes it to where he met Kaori as a child and has apparently been raising her ever since the death of Makimura, which... That's not how it was in the manga. He met Kaori at the very earliest when she was a teenager in high school, like close to her third year. And on top of that, they didn't officially start working together until she was 19. It's kind of a weird change, but I'm going to chalk it up to maybe the producer's daughter wanted to be in the movie and they wanted to do a favor, you know, something innocent like that instead of darker implications. Also, no Umibozo. You don't get to have the big guy, which makes me sad. But we shall move on and talk about the Korean drama that came out in 2011. This one is hard to describe. It received a lot of praise when it came out and even won awards in Korea for best actor, best drama, stuff like that. And I will admit, there were moments where I was having fun watching the ass kicking. But how does it stand up as a City Hunter adaptation? That's... okay. Um... So the basic premise of City Hunter is you have a hitman working in Japan that takes various jobs and usually finds himself in a situation that was bigger than he expected. Simple enough setup, and it leaves you open for a lot of different stories. Well, the Korean adaptation changes some things. You see, in 1983, there was an assassination of South Korean diplomats in Burma by the North Koreans. In retaliation, South Korea creates Operation Clean Sweep, where they infiltrate North Korea and assassinate different high-value targets. Two Secret Service guys joined the operation since they were both at the bombings, and during the operation, a council of five officials decide to abandon the team to avoid an international incident if it's revealed South Korea infiltrated the North. The team finishes their mission, but are betrayed as they try to escape back to the South. One of the Secret Service guys sacrifices himself to save his buddy, and the survivor decides to raise his surviving son to take revenge on the Council who betrayed them. Cut to 28 years later and the kid's all grown up and he has Beatles hair. They go after the Council, but the son starts having feelings for a female bodyguard and develops doubts over the revenge mission. What the fuck does any of this have to do with City Hunter? So yeah, as you can see, the connections to City Hunter are light to the point that multiple times I thought it was weird to even call it City Hunter. Now as stated, the show itself is fun, there's good action and the plot is at the very least interesting, but this isn't City Hunter. There's doing an adaptation and then there's using a name because it's popular. 
The cast is basically unrecognizable from their manga counterparts. The Ryo in this series, the guy's name is Yoon Song, isn't Ryo. Ryo in the manga never cared about avenging his family, because his family wasn't murdered. They died in a plane accident. Sure, he wants to kill the guy who raised him, but that's a step away from what the show does, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Also, Kaori is completely different too. In the manga, she was a normal girl who was dragged into the criminal lifestyle after the murder of her brother. But even then, she's a fish out of water that clearly isn't a vicious murderer or anything like that. In the show, she's a full-blown bodyguard for the Korean president, and she doesn't even have a brother either. Her tragedy is that her dad was put into a coma after a drunk driving accident and her mother died. That's just two examples, and it only gets more egregious as you go through the series, to the point that I genuinely don't know if they're trying to bring a character over or if they're doing something completely different. This is very clearly a separate show wearing the name City Hunter. If you're into K-dramas, you'll probably have a good time with it, but if you're looking for a City Hunter adaptation, this will just leave you confused. Like, a big part of the series is that City Hunter as a title is the name of a vigilante. Not a hitman, not someone you go to for a job, a flat-out vigilante. Which... no, that's not City Hunter. So China's attempt was mixed, South Korea did something completely different to the point that why would you bother calling it City Hunter? It seems like there's two misses on getting the definitive live-action adaptation that City Hunter deserves. What about that French adaptation I mentioned earlier? How did that one turn out? You're not gonna believe me, but it's interesting. Yeah, the French City Hunter movie is... a rabbit hole. To explain why this is even a thing, let's take a step back and add more context. Why the fuck is France even aware of what City Hunter is? Well, that's because when the manga was coming out, it was officially licensed in France. So it built up a sizable French fanbase, to the point that Hojo would even give nods to France in the manga. But there's a funny quirk with the French translation. Because it was the 80s and translation localization wasn't that great, it still isn't much better, but it is what it is. The French translators decided to change the names of characters. Rio Saiba is now Nicky Larson and thus the meme was born. Regardless, City Hunter was able to sink its claws into the wine-drinking, cheese-gulping degenerates, and in particular had an impact on a filmmaker named Philippe Lechou, the guy who would go on to direct and star in his own live-action adaptation of the manga. Now, manga adaptations outside of Japan have had a mixed history. Hell, manga adaptations in general have a mixed history. Some can be adapted in movies that are fucking masterpieces that a lot of people might not even guess were originally manga. Old Boy is the shining example here, though I will, I, I will give some credit to Road to Perdition. A lot of people don't realize that was an adaptation of Lone Wolf and Cub. Technically, it's an adaptation to a graphic novel that is inspired by Lone Wolf and Cub, though the creator has stated it's basically a homage and borderline remake. You also have the ones that are proud and wear their influences on their sleeve, your little battle angels. We're getting a sequel, by the way, which is pretty fucking cool. Then you have the ones that are made by people who explicitly hate the franchise, want to piss on it, and then outright insult the fans who are loyal to it for so long, your cowboy bebops and soon-to-be One Pieces. Which never makes sense to me, because why in God's name would a studio hand a profitable IP over to people who openly despise it? Yeah, they can run as many marketing campaigns as they want, saying, no, 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 we truly do love the franchise, but the resentment always slips through. You can't hide it. Then you remember a lot of it is just name snatching, and they don't really care how it turns out. You might think this is all a setup to shit on French City Hunter, implying that's the case here. But it's not. It is extremely not. In fact, the French City Hunter adaptation, real title Nicky Larson and Cupid's Perfume, is very good. It's easily the best live-action adaptation of the series, just out of sheer loyalty. So, Nicky Larson and the Cupid's Perfume follows the story of, well, Nicky Larson, who I'm just gonna call Riel because that's his actual name, fuck you, France. Him and Kaori receive a job one day to protect a scientist who has just created a prototype perfume that can make those around the user fall in love with them. The perfume is unintentionally stolen by a local businessman, Gilbert, who uses it to his advantage while completely unaware of the violent gang coming to steal it. So Rio, Kaori, and their loyal manservant Poncho, he's an original character from the movie, don't worry about him, have to find Gilbert before all hell breaks loose. So as you can see, the plot isn't really trying to impress anybody. It's mainly an excuse for wacky jokes and to play up the pulpy, dumb, fun aspects of City Hunter, which, yeah, this would absolutely be something the manga would do for a chapter. 
They outright had a ghost lady hire Rio to solve her own murder. Shit was wild. Philip Lachieu is a massive City Hunter fan. He grew up watching the original anime as a kid, and he went out of his way to pay tribute to the franchise. Hell, Tsukasa Hojo himself agreed to the adaptation after reading the script, because it really does feel like something he would write. The movie, while definitely leaning on more being a western-style comedy, respects City Hunter and knows why people like it. The characters look almost exactly like how they would in the manga. It's actually pretty impressive how close they got. Umi Bozo is nearly identical. Kaori too. In fact, she was she she was pretty cute, not gonna lie. Please follow me back on Facebook, I'm fucking begging you. There's also a ton of callbacks to the anime and manga throughout the movie. You have Ryo's iconic 357 Magnum, you get cameos from both the French voice actor for Ryo from the original anime, Vincent Ropion, and the interpreter who sang the French version of the end credit song, Jean-Paul Cesari. You even have this point of view style fight scene set to the action music from OG City Hunter. <laughs> It was pretty damn great, especially because the original anime had some pretty fucking rockin' tunes. If you really like 80s style Jap pop, you would love the soundtrack to City Hunter. It's great. I can't even deny, this scene was a highlight. It's basically a goofier version of Hardcore Henry, which is saying a lot. The action all around was fun. There was a lot of good sequences, and they were able to balance out the cartoon logic with some legitimate ass-kicking. Ryo is a goofy character, but he can absolutely throw down when the time calls for it. I really liked the, uh, the fight scene at the very end, set to Are You Gonna Be My Girl? That was just great. That had a lot of energy to it, and I thought that was cool as hell. Now, as stated, this movie leans way harder into being a comedy than anything else. And if a comedy falls flat, there isn't really much you can do to salvage it. Because bad comedy is just outright painful. Which raises the question, is Nikki Larson funny? Personally, yeah, it's pretty damn funny. Some scenes had me laughing out loud. Now, City Hunter's humor could, admittedly, be a tad one-note. It's mainly Ryo getting into trouble because he's horny 24-7. If you try to translate that to a live-action setting, you could easily run into an issue of trying to make a single joke funny for an hour and a half. Not impossible, but way harder than what it's worth. Even the Hong Kong City Hunter had a variety of jokes, and the K-drama was more of a political thriller that didn't focus on humor at all. Well, Nikki Larson has a variety of different gags. Gross-out jokes, physical comedy, quips between characters. Poncho's main role in the film is to be a comedic idiot, and Gilbert is another joke character where he's able to win over all these pretty ladies when he's just some dweeb. It definitely leans on the more vulgar side. I mean, they just outright have penis jokes where you see a dude's dick and that's the punchline. But fuck it, the manga did it too. Now, the story was simple, yeah, just find the MacGuffin and fight the bad men, but a lot of City Hunter plots are pretty simple, and the gimmick of the movie was used pretty effectively. You have long-running gags involving Ryo getting exposed to the perfume, quick shock humor jokes of how much chaos it can cause, they even make reference to the romantic tension between Ryo and Kaori with it. I can't even lie, this movie was a lot of fun, to the point that I've seen this one multiple times. If you're a fan of the franchise, I definitely recommend giving it a watch, but good luck fucking finding it anywhere if you're an American. Maybe the Europe Rose are different, but finding this movie was a fucking nightmare. No streaming service carries it, and the only way I could watch it was finding a torrent and downloading a separate subtitle track. So that was fun. Regardless, I'd actually say it was worth the effort. It's so loyal that you could argue it's basically a glorified fan film, which I mean, it kinda is. But I truly enjoyed this movie, and I had a good time with it. Maybe it's biased, because I really like City Hunter as a franchise, but I honestly can't say this movie was bad. There's soul put into this, and honestly, we should prop up examples of adaptations made by creators that truly love the source material. Philippe worked his ass off for this movie, and personally, I think it shows. But this raises the ultimate question. What about the Japanese live-action adaptation? Yeah, it's not out yet. That's right, over the span of 40 years, with tons of different animes and foreign films about the franchise, Japan never attempted their own. It's only just recently that they announced that City Hunter will receive a live-action Japanese film for Netflix, directed by Yuichi Sato. I hope it's good. The guy they got to play Ryo looks pretty fitting for the role, but we just won't know until it's out. Oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me, China's doing another one. France is making a live-action Cat's Eye series, too. Now, the only stuff left to talk about are the spin-offs. As of right now, you have two official spin-offs, Angel Heart and City Hunter Rebirth. I'm gonna talk about that one first, because it's the weirdest. It's not actually written by Tsukasa Hojo. Okay, I'll get into that, as this is weird on every single level. Instead, the author is listed as Nishiki Sokura. Kind of. 
Hojo is also listed as an author, and some sources flat out say he's the writer while Sokoro does the art. It's back and forth, I can't find anything conclusive, my head hurts. So fuck it, they're working on it in collaboration, we'll go with that. The story follows a 44-year-old woman living in Japan who is a massive City Hunter fangirl. One day, she is tragically killed in a train accident, but instead of going to heaven or hell, she's reincarnated into the story of City Hunter as a high school girl. And her goal is to some way find a way home and not mess with the plot. But she's forced to intervene and get Ryo's help as every attempt to return to her world fails miserably. I said earlier that this was the City Hunter Izikai. Now you can see that was not a joke. It is literally an Izikai story about someone entering City Hunter which is quite unconventional. Usually, Izekai stories throw the person into some D&D ripoff world and call it a day. Having them enter an established manga that also exists in their world, that's a brain bender. Really, this is sort of a remix of the City Hunter story. Plot points are shifted around, certain characters show up way earlier than they did before, and there's more of an attempt to build a linear plot. It also throws some wrenches into the story by introducing new villains, and plays on the expectations of somebody who read through the manga already. I have no idea how to recommend this to somebody without making it sound worse than it is, because I actually kind of like this one. Yeah, it's technically an easy guy, but it pokes fun at its own concept plenty of times. And at least it's more creative than just dipshit McBoring ass becomes strongest douche in Narnia. You know what I mean? Give it a read, you might actually end up liking it. Now the actual official spin-off, the one that can't be debated, is Angel Heart. Angel Heart is a sort of kind of sequel to City Hunter, taking place immediately after the end of the manga. The plot follows a female assassin from Taiwan that is critically injured during a job. She receives a heart transplant and discovers that she is starting to channel the memories of the heart's owner. So she goes on a quest for answers of who the owner of the heart is and why she was almost killed, and the owner of the heart was Kaori. Yeah, Kaori is killed right before the wedding for her and Ryo. She dives in front of a car to save somebody else from being hit and is rendered brain dead. Her heart is taken due to her being an organ donor, and it is then stolen and put on the black market, where the Taiwanese assassin, with a name I can't even pretend to know how to pronounce, I'm just gonna call her Glassheart because that's her code name, gets it. Yeah, they kill Kaori off, which is a pretty major shift considering how important she is to the story of City Hunter. She's outright the second protagonist along with Ryo. Well, before you start getting Shining Heresy, Fist of the North Star Part 2 flashbacks, don't worry. This isn't just a shock thing that was done to give Ryo a new love interest or anything like that. The entire story is about how much the death of Kaori fucks up Ryo. It is a considerably darker take than the original City Hunter, exploring loss, regret, redemption. It even reveals new aspects of the cast you didn't see in the original manga. Ryo and Glassheart end up developing a sort of father-daughter relationship, with Glassheart trying to find redemption from her life as an assassin, and Ryo trying to come back to humanity after losing the woman he loved. If you like City Hunter, but wanted a more bitter story that looked at the dark side of the world, this is exactly for you. It's a pretty miserable story at times. Not completely joyless, but it goes for the throat with some of the emotional beats. Now, Angel Heart itself actually became a franchise, getting a 50-episode long anime and even a live-action TV series in 2015. They adapted Angel Heart before City Hunter. Man, Japan could be confusing sometimes. Now, if you're worried that you basically have to read one franchise before you start the other, it's not really like that. I mean, it would help to know the context behind Kaori and why she's important to Ryo, but you can start Angel Heart as its own thing, and I feel like it's just fine. It even managed to last all the way to 2017, so it definitely built up its own fan base and was able to stand on its own as one of Hojo's franchises. Technically, it's in its own separate timeline, completely relegated as a spinoff. So really, it's as canon as you want it to be. There's definitely elements that point to it being a sequel. For one, it's quite literally the sequel. It continues the events of the story and addresses plot points that happened before. Though there are major canon deviations, such as Mickey now being Falcon's young adopted daughter instead of his lover like in Mainline City Hunter. But City Hunter canon says that the actual ending is Ryo and Kaori riding off into the sunset together. So if you like these two and want to see them get their happy ending, that's exactly what happened. Angel Heart is there for people willing to see a more emotional, darker take on City Hunter. Something a bit more grim, since it opens up with a pretty massive kick to the gut if you're a fan. Kaori was a crucial character to the series, and her death permeates throughout Angel Heart. They don't hold back on stressing how much this messes up the cast. Angel Heart isn't bad. Some people outright love it. And really, it was kind of brilliant of Hojo to list it as a spin-off and a what-if story. If you want it to be canon, it's canon. If you don't want it to be, it's not. So really, 
everybody's happy. It's basically like one of the Fate spinoffs, where it's just asking a hypothetical, what if this happened? Regardless, that's pretty much City Hunter. We covered most every adaptation, at least the ones that are currently out and are directly tied to City Hunter. Hopefully you guys will take the time to get into this series. It's shitloads of fun. Check out the anime, check out Nikki Larson and Cupid's Perfume. Most importantly, check out the manga. You'll love it. If you love old crime shows, you'll love it. If you like goofy comedies, you'll love it. If you like classic action manga, you'll love it. There's a reason this series refuses to stay dead. Because really, it's a pretty immortal concept. You can put it in modern day with basically zero translation issues. It works in the modern day just as well as if you put it in the 80s. It has a very loyal following, mostly in Japan and France. In fact, some of you French bros might have been excited that I talked about this. Hopefully this video causes City Hunter to get more love in other countries, because this truly is a great series, and deserves respect alongside the all-time classics, because that's exactly what it is. Here's hoping Angel Dust is a good send-off for the series. I'm excited for it. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. Hey, loser. Do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're going to be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's going to look at you funny. There's going to be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're gonna plant crack in your house, and they're gonna arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.